All right, so let's begin our presentation. Thank you again for joining us. And we are very excited to dive into our topic today. And thank you to our, our partners, including MicroStrategy and Wipro, for joining us. And um, before we begin, let's go ahead and uh, out um, a couple of housekeeping items. Throughout our presentation today, uh, we do encourage all of our attendees to engage with us through the chat and Q&A feature that you see uh, within the OM24 console. We will be taking all of your questions towards the end of our presentation, so we will leave time to, to do that. But feel free to submit questions as they come. If we don't get to everybody's questions at the end, we will certainly revisit that with you. And this session is indeed being recorded, and we absolutely will be sending the recorded version to you within 24 to 48 hours after our presentation. And I want to uh, point out that there are lots of resources available to download directly from the ON24 platform, first of which is being our very exciting report from Harvard Business Review that you see uh, on the slide in front of you. That is available for download and ready for you to review, as is the focal point for today's presentation. Uh, before we begin, I want to extend a warm welcome to our presenters. I'd like to first welcome Alex Sujarto. And Alex is the Head of Strategy for Data Analytics and Artificial Intelligence at Wipro. He leads the competitive intelligence, marketing, and planning for the DAAI business to empower Wipro leaders with effective predictive insights and thought leadership to ensure clients' relationships are not just deals but lasting platforms. And thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. Our next presenter is Vijay Anand. Vijay is responsible for product strategy and positioning at MicroStrategies Enterprise Analytics and Mobility Solutions. He has led several marketing initiatives for high-performance business analytics, cloud intelligence, and software-as-a-service BI offerings. He works closely with his technology team to, draw, to drive product development and roadmap while working closely with customers, partners, and their global sales team. Welcome, Vijay. And our third presenter today is Jeannie Liu. Jeannie Liu is a product marketing manager at Snowflake, uh, the data warehouse built for the cloud. Jeannie has extensive experience in big data, backup and recovery, and database technology. And prior to joining us here at Snowflake, Jeannie was the director of product marketing at, at Datos.io. Jeannie, am I saying that name right? Uh, a distributed database backup and recover company that was recently acquired by Rubrik. And she is very passionate about bringing technology and products to life. Welcome to our presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Good to be here. So let's go through our agenda today. As you see, we're going to be tackling um, our HBR project overview. I will be giving you a little bit of insight into what the project entailed. We're also going to be going and uh, actually revealing the results and some very poignant pieces of information that the um, HBR Analytics Services Group have driven for us. Um, we're also going to be talking about some uh, use cases, and we'll, um, this, this entire presentation is going to be very conversational. So again, um, we do encourage you to submit your questions if any come to mind and we will be uh, addressing those. So um, let's get right into, um, into our report findings here. And I'd like to first uh, start out with a quote that was driven by HBR around the intelligent enterprise. So all roads today leading to the intelligent enterprise, one that is agile, innovative, customer-centric, and enough to survive and thrive in an increasingly complex and competitive environment. I think that that all probably makes great sense for all of us. And I'd like to start just by giving a few words about what the scope of this project and research uh, um, entailed. So we set out to get some answers. Um, what is the intelligent enterprise and what does it mean to be data driven? So this was conducted by HBR, their analytics services group, where we surveyed a total of 729 global business leaders and thought leaders, subject matter experts, and these participants span across 
um, our major industries uh, and, and focus um, focus largely on financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, and CPG, as well as technology. So let's go ahead and get into some actual definitions, um, and then we'll start getting into the highlights here. So, um, Vijay, let's start with you, and let's talk about how MicroStrategy actually defines the intelligent enterprise. You know, as, 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 a, as a company that's been around for about 30 years, focusing on business intelligence analytics, um, in 2018, our focus and our focal point in everything that we do is, is, has been in making our customers more intelligent enterprises. So, although they're enterprises, we want to be able to make them represent the ultimate data-driven organization. And what I mean by that is they're able to inject data at the heart of its business and inspires uh, an information-first culture. Uh, and they can do this by fueling every experience, not just for people, but also for devices and applications and processes with, with on-the-fly insights and predictions and recommendations that help them make uh, smarter everyday decisions. Right? So it helps them celebrate data and, and do better things uh, and, and help them understand their customers, which ultimately uh, will help them provide products and services that are tailored uh, to their end users. Um, and also, in a world where, you know, where departmental silos information doesn't cut it anymore, the intelligent enterprise goes beyond traditional analytics that, that traditionally, you know, limited itself to basic data discovery, but elevates itself uh, to help the overall workforce increase their intelligence by gaining access to insight and information and recommendations and predictions in everything that they do. That's great. Um, Jeannie, let's, let's point the conversation to you. Do you have anything to add to this? Sure. Thank you, Melanie. So I definitely agree with everything with Vijay said. However, I would say that I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all definition, especially when it comes to defining um, what intelligent means and what an intelligent enterprise holistically means. A common theme I see, though, is that when I look at the most intelligent enterprises, they really use their data assets effectively to achieve their data desired outcomes faster. So what I mean by that is that they're able to hone in on the specific data sets that they need in order to create the right resources and in order to align it with the organization to achieve the outcomes. Um, and the key point here is that they do it with far less risk, or I should say they do it with much more calculated risk. Thanks. And, and how about you, Alex? Any um, Anything to add here in, in terms of the highlights and uh, the way that the numbers are actually lining up from, from the survey? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think this is a really interesting discussion. We're, we're all taking it from a little bit different perspective. And, you know, and at Wipro, we're looking at we're, – we're consulting an um, outsourcing company. And so when we've been talking to clients about the intelligent enterprise, really emphasizing – their their customers' journeys, you know, the the value journeys that, that the enterprise has to go through and the different operations and functions and how they're changing, uh, and the data journey and the trust that has to go into the data, security of the data. So I think that all rolls up to what, what Vijay and Jeannie were saying as well around being data-driven and the analytics and and the different components of, of the value that go into that. Um, what what maybe surprises me a little bit looking at our survey is it is kind of old habits die hard, right? We're seeing that many folks do have the right vision, the right approach, but they're really seeing lots of challenges implementing um, the, the different components to really bring the analytics to life in their organizations. Uh, so what we're trying to do uh, working with clients is really how do they get teams to adopt their analytics. And we've, for example, worked with HP around their sales analytics and the sales teams. And they've been able to put in a really good system, but really at the end of the day, being able to show how those commission payments get to the sales team faster, how those sales leaders are connected through their different channels, the, the type of feedback they can get from the data, that's really making the adoption go faster. So when I look at the highlights and I think about some of the stalls that may be happening, I think, you know, it's part of the challenge is how, how to bring that value to the users uh, in, in an increasingly uh, 
um, direct and, and a tactical way. Yeah, and then I have to just add to that to just say that, you know, the the average about 20 to 30 percent adoption rates that, you know, which is industry standard, especially from a data and analytics standpoint, it's, it's fairly low. Right. And 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 frankly, if you think about it, it's not just the skill get skill gap that's to, that's to blame. It's it maybe the technology and the techniques that you're using to inject it into everyday workflows. Uh, for instance, at one of our customers at with Merck, um, even before they started training on a new mobile app they rolled out to fuel the experiences of their sales reps, uh, they were able to double the adoption rate, right, even before the first minute of training. Uh, it was because it engaged them in a way that the experiences uh, lended itself to become a part of their job role. Uh, it, every action that they do, when they meet their customer, they you have a consumer-based app that they can use to work with their clients. Right? So if you are able to intelligently and uniquely find ways to inject it into the, the job roles, whether you're a field technician or whether you are a financial planner or whether you are a sales rep or, you know, someone at the, uh, the laundry, right, um, you are able to find ways to incorporate data and analytics into their job roles and into the workflows of their lives. And I think that necessarily drives adoption uh, by engaging with them on the, and connecting with them at that level. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely agree with those ideas. That's, that's great insight. Let, let's get into one really um, interesting point here. Um, as we start uh, to kind of break this down by industry, talking about the major goals by industry as they look into being a more data-driven uh, organization and breaking this up by our five major industries, um, I'm going to pass it to Jeannie just to talk about some of the interesting findings here as, as we take a look at the, the top goals here. Sure. So I'll say overall I thought this, uh, survey was very helpful, especially to see it broken down by financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, and tech. So um, just to see the clarity around the priorities by by industry. One important thing to note um, here is that enterprises across all these verticals would agree that the goal that is really top of mind is getting better insight into the customer needs and expectations. And why I think this is so important and what um, what we see daily up here at Snowflake is that customers are, you know, they're really a really complex demographic puzzle. And, you know, there are, you and I know that there are a lot of CRM tools out there and other software programs um, where they extract chunks of information from all the noise. And that's what's key here. It's not so much aggregating of, of loads and volumes of data, but really honing in on um, the, the insights. So it's about making the right decisions based upon the um, the information that's provided to you. So um, when I look at better insight into customer needs and expectations, I'm not surprised by that by any uh, by any means. Uh, what I am surprised at is that how large it is and what the um, sort of the, the lean is for each of these verticals. It seems to be very top of mind for them. And how about you, Alex? Anything to, to add here? Alex, are, are you on with us? Yeah, I agree with all that discussion. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, talking to myself on mute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no problem. You know, I think one of the interesting questions is, is, is the question of innovation. And, I, and when, when we're thinking about data-driven, uh, it's this, this top-down and versus bottom-up. So I think that there's a lot of role for small innovations. Incremental improvements make a big difference. So when we talk about the, you know, the, being able to democratize the analytics, being able to uh, really bring self-service to users, th those are the small innovations that we see that – Add up and make a big difference. So when I when I look at the opportunity here, particularly in this goal by industry um, data set, I, that, that's where I, I say you know maybe there's a, an opportunity to focus on what can be done in that region. And how about you, Vijay? Anything to to add before we move into the actual maturity uh, numbers here? 
You know, it's it's not surprising that um, insight into customer needs ranked pretty high on this list. Everything that everyone wants to do with data is to get um, in in touch with their customers. Uh, it's going to be interesting how um, the mobile phone uh, adoption of that and consumerization of business apps uh, and lending itself to make itself available on mobile phones and the ability to track telemetry with location intelligence is going to fuel those experiences. It's already doing you know, fantastic in the retail space. Um, from uh, healthcare, of course, there's there's you know security and those aspects of it that flow into it. And how does one circumvent those rules and guidelines and yet do it in an ethical manner to be able to fuel those experiences so you can get in touch with your customers uh, and serve their needs uh, and, and by, by actually connecting with them and, and being helpful to them, right? And, 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 and the mobile phone is going to be a fantastic means to be able to do that. Uh, Google's already doing that, you know, as, as, as you are using Google today uh, and you start planning your routes to work. Uh, it tells you exactly how much time it takes based on traffic and it gives you alerts and notifications. And from a consumer standpoint, it's already helping you. How does enterprises take those guidelines and inject those consumer behaviors into their applications to be able to connect with their consumers? Uh, that's going to be interesting to see over the next five to ten years. So interesting on this next piece of data here, talking about what people are actually doing and what they have today, their sense of uh, maturity in terms of standardized reporting. We see some numbers around embedded data, what is important to them, how they feel about uh, maybe progressing to uh, some better numbers here. What do we think this is kind of breaking down, um, uh, you know, in terms of industry adoptability? So, uh, so just uh, maybe a, a couple quick observations, right? If you look at the standardized reporting, data governance, a lot of organizations say that they've put that together. So, so we see that as, you know, this digital organizational transformation that's starting to happen because those are important things for an organization to have. But then when you when we start to then put that other um, filter on around data driven organization. I see some gaps in terms of what our uh, respondents of the survey said. Uh, they, they don't have that uh, data and analytics and predictive capability uh, across uh, all of the industries that we're looking at. In fact, you know, it's the lowest one, 7% uh, of the, uh, was the average response to, across this whole data set. So, so that's a, a big gap. And what, then what, what that leads to is what other components are really hindering that predictive capability. Uh, so when we think about it, we're, we're trying to put together the tools that lead to predictive. Our clients thinking about the right architectures, the right platforms? Are they really thinking about the right systems that they need to, beyond just the data governance? You know, uh, we put together a homes platform for uh, greater automation. Uh, we think about how clients are really building their ecosystem of partners. And so that's what's so great about us being on the call together because we see clients increasingly needing to put uh, a real solution that doesn't come from one single provider. So that's an important component to, to really uh, get to that data driven that's, that we see uh, and the issues we see in clients putting together a complete solution for the enterprise. So th those are some thoughts. I think there's probably a lot more thoughts from my colleagues here, so I'll, I'll let them kind of chime in. From a maturity standpoint, you know, this is definitely in line with what we've seen with several other surveys, and Gartner, uh, the authority on surveys, has also come up with similar um, uh, numbers that show that maturity hasn't really escalated despite the advent of these easy, sexy tools that were, you know, launched early in, like, in the 2011-2012 era, right, where self-service was king. Um, and, and today, if you go to uh, any of their events, uh, it's no more self-service. It's AI and machine learning and all of this, right? Um, and, you know, and this only translates to the sense that while self-service aimed at arming business users to become and dry, the leaders in terms of driving that um, bottoms-up approach to help business dictate what they need and, and empower them to create analytics. 
it necessary it ne didn't necessarily do that right if you think about your own teams like you know if you have a team of 50 people how many within that team are actually capable of building a trustworthy dashboard that can be circulated throughout the organization not very much right it's it's definitely under 5 to 10% and you're not going to be able to fill that skill gap by training or any of that because you're not trying to bridge the gap of data literacy. But what we're trying to do is find unique ways of embedding content in a way that you don't need to make people data literate. You make answers find people, right? You don't find you don't make people find answers. Um, embedded definitely in one of the surveys that we recently conducted at MicroStrategy revealed itself as the top way to reach people, right? You bring the insights to people in the applications that they love and the applications that they live in, right? Like email and Word and SharePoint. How do you surface it intelligently, uh, whether it's with natural language or whether it's with alerts and notifications? How do you in increasingly inject it into people's lives without essentially trying to mature their skill gap, right? Uh, and become a part of that that process of growing into that intelligent enterprise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so let's go ahead and move into our next portion, which is really beyond sort of describing the challenges and findings that we've seen. I'm going into a prescriptive discussion, um, and it's very interesting. I'd like to open this to the, the panel here as we discuss some of these interesting numbers that we see here. Um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Vijay here to talk about, um, you know, uh, traditional BI and reporting, uh, talking about diagnostic more so than, um, you know, just describing some of these issues. If you look at this, right, this is still um, hinging back on that whole maturity wave. Uh, how do you go from descriptive and diagnostic, which is, you know, uh, reporting and, and even self-service falls into diagnostic, into AI-based and machine learning-based applications that evolve into predictive and prescriptive um, applications. And, and while self-service had its time, I don't think it worked. Uh, I think the pendulum is swinging back towards letting organizations know that they need to in invest in a foundational semantic layer that indexes all of their corporate information because that's going to be the model for not just AI, right, which uh, includes all of these predictive and prescriptive applications. You, you, you're going to set the foundation for trusted AI, right? Uh, and AI only becomes valuable when you can actually trust it. And, 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 and the way we've thought about building that semantic strength is by actually making the semantic model a living model, meaning that it has the ability to learn and train itself based on telemetry-based information, based on where people are, what they're doing, and who they are, and provide contextual recommendations and insights uh, to drive those experiences. So definitely the foundation for building that foundation for predictive and prescriptive applications would be to invest in much like what Google did for themselves, right? Their knowledge graph didn't evolve overnight. It's something that they've invested in and it's growing and becoming smarter by usage every day, right? Based on who you are and where you are, it is able to make recommendations and it did not take it a day to learn. It took, you know, years of using Google and them logging and tracking your information to be able to tell you which restaurant makes a better match based on your preferences and the times you've spent searching online and, and being in specific restaurants, right? So the ability for any system to do that uh, on, com on, on, on boundless data is something Google has achieved. It's up to organizations to do that on a limited set of system of record data, which ironically sounds simpler, um, but that's the investment in the semantic layer or graph, as we call it, uh, is, is going to prove itself to be valuable in building out these predictive and prescriptive applications. Mm -hmm. So let, let's move into the organizational barriers here. It, it, it's one thing, again, to kind of identify some of these challenges, um, but how are people kind of uh, taking on moving beyond some of these barriers that we're, we're seeing? And I'm going to let Jeannie take on this. 
it's really interesting to identify some of these issues here. Um, as folks have, uh, you know, um, great goals of striving to become more modern and data-driven, um, Jeannie, what do you think here about what the data is showing us? Sure. So it's been clear throughout this entire presentation is that um, exploiting the data and analytics is key. But in my opinion, um, and this chart will confirm, it's really about management really transforming the organization so that the data and the models actually yield better decisions. And what we can see as the top five barriers is that um, you have organizational silos, legacy processes, which can be solved through technology, um, lack of key digital and analytic skills, resistance to change in current organization structure and peace transformation efforts is that management plays a really large part in making sure that these barriers are, um, are lifted. Uh, the other thing I would say is that it's not just about the organization itself, but it's really building towards uh, an, an effective, um, really, data set that improves performance. So if I look at what goal I'm trying to achieve, it's not so much that it's something that I've thought about, but it's something that can actually be measured. And that's another thing that I would say is that it's not just about organizing the actual people around it, but organizing the people around a specific goal. And how about from the rest of the panel? Um, what do you, um, what are you also sort of seeing, just even in your own field and, and work with your clients? Do you think that this rings true in the real world? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're seeing these challenges uh, popping up everywhere. You know, and, and it's part of that. Um, if you don't have executive leadership, this organizational change, as we know, is really difficult. And so all, all of the organizational barriers do come up. And that's and then that's the question that comes to many clients that are really trying to do small things and make some improvements. But at the end of the day, having some of this structure is important. I, I think some of our other results show that many of our respondent organizations have components of the structure in place, and they're moving to really become organizationally aligned to, to the data-driven challenges. But, you know, it's clear that the gaps of being predictive and being a predictive organization and, and those other issues that we've seen in, throughout the survey uh, point to the fact that there's still some organizational uh, barriers and misalignments out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anything to add, Vijay, before we talk about actually the, the technology barriers here? No, these um, these four barriers that you have listed out here are current definitely, you know, amongst the top barriers that we've seen amongst our own customers as well. Um, silos being a big one, uh, and, and with the number of analytics vendors out there and the technologies out there, it definitely uh, pays to have processes and techniques in place, uh, and it's definitely people who are aligned with each other. Um, you know, I'm in marketing, so instead of the four Ps, I, I always focus on the three Ps, the product, processes, and people. Um, how do you get, whether it's IT and business people in the same room, to break those barriers and silos? Right, to talk to each other, whether you want to roll out self-service or whether you want to build applications that are scalable and high performance. Um, and, and, and moving away from legacy, while it can be an expensive affair, um, what are the pros and cons? But those that takes processes and people in place to be able to go get through that dialogue and to define your goals and, and see what you can do to achieve them. Um, but these are definitely the barriers we see as well, so we're in line with uh, what you're showing here. Okay, great. So to some specific issues around technology, um, Jeannie, let's, let's have you take this one in terms of what you're seeing. Um, you know, data silos leading to data consistency issues and um, this whole thing kind of going back to a centralized platform where the data can be looked at uh, as a whole picture, if you will. Absolutely, Melanie. And one of the things I'll notice here is that as I was looking through the technological barriers, I couldn't help to, but to notice that organizational technological barriers, although they seem so uh, independent, they're actually very intertwined. So let's look at the list. We see three of the top five technological barriers actually apply to the data itself. So you have data silos, data consistency issues, and lack of a centralized platform to actually capture data. 
And why this is important is that um, enterprises that are skilled at identifying which data to use, both inside and outside the organization, focus on the analytics that help teams deliver on goals. So what this means is that they're actually looking at putting in the right people in place, as BJ mentioned before, the right capabilities. Um, I think the saying goes, holds true, what gets measured is actually what gets managed. So um, we can talk about technology in a very abstract sense, or we can talk about it in a very tactical sense. At the end of the day, I really do think it comes down to the actual use of data and how it's going to enable organizations to move forward. Yeah, it, and you know, just to add to that, while when you think about it, um, especially when it pertains to analytics, the centralized platform and and the and the semantic path, while the traditional systems definitely evolved around us, this was the, you know the early 2000s and even before, um, you know, usually the connotation is are those legacy systems, but having been through the wave of self-service tools, uh, we see the pendulum swinging back towards centralized platforms to be able to prevent data silos, right, and to prevent governing issues, uh, to, uh, to, to help embrace that single version of the truth. Uh, so we're definitely seeing the pendulum swing back towards it, but how do you leverage that, that centralized platform in a way that you're delivering information and experiences to your end users uh, that are not complex, which is what number five here is indicating, right, uh, in a way that uh, whether you're using natural language or whether you're using voice-guided applications uh, that are helping uh, the 80% of the organization that are not necessarily data deliberate to be able to understand data in a way that they can because it's a part of their job, because it's helping them be better and do better, right? And it's not not just complex reporting and, and, and uh, advanced metrics that are dictating how you do your role, but it's essentially advice and recommendations that help you prosper, right? That are user-friendly, but in a way that you actually want to be able to use it. We have a customer uh, who has about a team of uh, uh, business uh, development representatives, the BDRs of pre-sales, of about 7,000 people, right? And typically, in, in B, uh, BDRs of sale, uh, pre-sales are, are straight out of school, no real experience, especially no experience with analytics. But how do you make them successful on day one? You provide them with an easy-to-use interface where they can actually use like they would with Google, right? So we have customers who uh, are picking up the call, uh, and these are pre-sales people, and they're calling their, um, their potential prospects or customers, and um, they are trying to sell them, let's say, an ad space, right? They are able to type their competitors into this Google-like in uh, uh, interface. Let's say they're calling Pepsi. They type Coca-Cola and they get all of their KPIs for Coca-Cola and they tell Pepsi, hey, Pepsi, uh, Coca-Cola was able to achieve X, Y, Z. Do you want that? Right? Suddenly they become data or metric driven, but not in a way where they were put into a class, learn how to use a dashboarding tool, but they were able to, you know, inject analytics into their job role. Um, so essentially, how do you make these current solutions less complex and more user friendly is, is the way it, and, and the way you do that is by embedding it into the applications they live in and, and the applications they want to use to be able to flourish in their jobs. I think that's excellent, excellent insight. And, and let's move into our next session, which um, is to provide some good sage advice for our audience here talking about how they can actually mobilize their data analytics. Um, and let's start with, with Wipro here, and let's talk about um, some real pieces of advice here that you would kind of share with our group here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is an interesting uh, idea here that we're talking about, which is how do you bring together people process your technology platforms in the cloud, right? And, and one of the things that we're seeing many of our clients uh, talking about is really now moving towards internet scale. So, so here's something that also I've thought about um, around the results of our survey, which is that part of the, the challenges that we see with organizations is that they're, they're dealing with different scales, right? So they're dealing, uh, as Vijay said, moving from that self-service to the semantic uh, uh, thought process, which is uh, really re-architecting. So how do you find the right 
architecture solution approach for your organization based on the scale that you're at. Uh, one of the things that we're also talking about is really a cloud data platform. So when you're talking about a hybrid cloud environment, you have on-premise systems, you have uh, cloud systems, and data is going to be sitting in various places. It's going to require a different way to integrate that data. And so we're thinking that there's there's this uh, brokered approach, new new approach that has to happen. And so those are a couple of the types of barriers that we see coming into play. Um, around becoming more predictive and really aggregating the data, getting the scale, the Google scale of data that you need, uh, you know, testing the right type of data to bring into your AI applications. All of that stuff is based on the type of the, the scale that you're working with today. That, that's, that's one of the thoughts that we're having right now. And Vijay, how about you? What, what, what is MicroStrategy's stance here? You know, mobility is one of the big pillars for MicroStrategy uh, to build that intelligent enterprise. Uh, and we think it is probably the most impactful way uh, to drive higher rates of adoption. Uh, and the reason is because with mobile, you're able to send out proactive alerts, which draws people into the mobile app and makes them more aware of, you know, the changing and trending performance metrics. And by also incorporating write back or transactional options into system of records, and that's what really moves the needle um, from for, in, through a mobile app and, and, and creating that digital transformation. Um, with some of our customers like uh, PetSmart comes to mind, um, they essentially have changed their culture uh, because of a mobile device, right? Uh, once they were a recent uh, redesign of their uh, of one of their warehouses or, or manufacturing plants, they realize that the managers don't need offices because they're always with their mobile device. So it's definitely reshaping the culture of, of uh, how mobile plays into uh, organizations into making them more digitally transformed and making them more intelligent. And, 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 and beyond that, you know, within their sales team alone, it's not one or two apps. They have 20 different applications just for their sales team. So that speaks volumes as to adoptions of not just the number of people, but also adoption of the types of data and how they operate uh, within their daily lives. So mobile is definitely uh, a, a fantastic way to, to move along any analytics effort. Um, and, and frankly, you know, when we speak to people, it's, it's not something that they can conceptually have the idea for. It's seeing is believing, so I would encourage uh, anyone who's looking or thinking about mobile to really uh, experiment with whether it's a POC or, or looking at uh, models of where you can actually uh, find value in it because it really is seeing is believing um, before even trying to think of uh, how and come up with ideas uh, without actually having the device in your hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one major category here is the cloud and the overall efficiency and advantages to doing business in the cloud. Um, Jeannie, talk about Snowflake here and why the cloud is so critical uh, in a mobile world. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. So, um, Vijay, to your point earlier, you talked about how mobile is really reshaping the culture. I see that here with cloud uh, really reshaping the culture. So. There's so many advantages, and I can get into an entire laundry list of what the advantages are and the efficiencies um, of storing and analyzing and sharing data in the cloud. But what it does, frankly, is it removes the chaos that can result from siloed, duplicated data that becomes disconnected, and it's very disjointed. So what I'd like to conclude from with this discussion is that the cloud has really given us the notion of what's possible uh, when you build a da data warehouse. What I mean by that is that the traditional vendors took a really simple approach. They moved their on-prem data warehouse solutions to the cloud, and it actually worked. It worked for their customers. Um, the customers experienced a few benefits, but they've only really scratched the surface of what a cloud data warehouse could actually do. And I can go into the um, the actual benefits of Snowflake if there are questions, but it's the organizational benefits that one can achieve with a data warehouse built for the cloud far outweighs any on-prem solution. Yeah, I'm quite fascinated so, with cloud and technology trends. Uh, and like I said, 
find that digital identity is very important. And that's something that MicroStrategy is focused on because uh, using telemetry-based applications on your smartphones uh, allows you to get in touch with your customers. Not in like a creepy way, but in a much more, in a way that you're able to help and be a part of their lives to be able to service them with contextual recommendations and advice and really create maybe even, you know, if you think about loyalty cards, right, what better application than something on your mobile phone or whether you're using it to board your planes anyway today. Uh, so the ability and the power that it has is immense and we definitely at MicroStrategy has em have embraced the digital identity or as badge as we call it as part of our platform to be a part of our entire intelligence offering. Uh, and, and we definitely use that to drive telemetry-based applications based on location intelligence uh, using these digital identity apps. Um, it is also interesting to note that the top goal for the most of the industries here was centered around the customer interest. And, and of course, that lends itself to the whole like, notion of digital identity and how you can actually keep in touch with them. Um, and, and, and frankly, one of the top things that stood out here is that it is good to see that companies are no longer seeing uh, executive level support uh, is is, uh, is 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 not uh, is, is not they're not no, no longer think that's an issue anymore, right? And if you look at the trends today, the advent of roles like the CDO or the chief analytics officer speaks volumes to that. About three years ago, the number percentage of organizations that had a CDO was less than 10 percent. Today, it's at a much higher percent based on some reports by PwC and some others. Uh, and it's because people are realizing that there is no other option than becoming data-centric uh, to do your everyday options. And, I'm, and, and it's very uh, encouraging to see that as well. Yeah, and, and one of the things I would add is perhaps when, when, when you do take a look at the survey, there's a question around uh, confidence that many organizations expressed to become data-driven. And, and I think my surprise is that it, it's uh, not a lot of confidence overall that uh, everyone's going to make this transition. And so one of the things that we're seeing that is a, is a, a barrier to this transition is capability. So uh, having the right data scientists, having the right uh, types of leads uh, on programs and uh, architecture, uh, having the right understanding of technologies and, and those capabilities that organizations need uh, really to think about the different types of journeys that they're going on. Um, that's something that I think is going to be very important in the way that organizations put together uh, their approach. Uh, we're seeing things like centers of excellence around data science. We're seeing uh, considerations of how to bring talent into an organization, either through crowdsourcing or through um, some specific uh, delivery capabilities, delivery centers. Those, those are the evolution of the way that many organizations have been bringing capability in, and that's going to be increasingly important with the speed and the rate of change that some of the technologies that we're talking about demand. So um, that's a that's a a challenge that we see clients addressing every day. So what I wanted to do is is get right into our Q and A session that you'll uh, that you'll um, see on your screen here, and we do have a couple of questions. I just want to first address uh, Jeannie. It looks like we've got a great question for you. Um, okay, outside of the actual organization. Uh, that is an intelligent enterprise. Who else benefits from this? Sure, Mel. So let me think about this. I think there are really three main groups that benefit. Um, one is the employees, the second is the partners, and the third are the actual customers. So when I talk about employees, the technology that comes with innovation and being an intelligent enterprise and the automation that also comes with that, um, that can actually take over a lot of the mundane tasks that employees may do on a day-to-day -day basis. So think of data entry or other things that um, folks could probably use their time doing other creative things with. So that's a really big benefit for employees. 
The second is partners. Intelligent enterprises, as we know today, rely increasingly on a broader ecosystem. And so by leveraging their partners and being smart about the decisions they make with their partners, both stand to benefit. And finally, last but not least, uh, it's pretty obvious that customers, they receive better service, better products. Um, they're served what they need when they need it because there's so much clarity and insight into who customer the customers of an intelligent enterprise are. So summing up what I said, uh, it sounds a little counterintuitive that an enterprise, intelligent enterprise would do things with simplicity because there are so many inputs, but I think overall the simplicity is what allows the intelligent enterprise to serve all three groups. That's great. Alex, are you on the audio as well still? Yeah, I'm, make sure yeah, we have a... I'm here. <laughs> all right, so excellent. I... Any, anything to add here? Yeah, I, I just reinforced the, the kind of the points I made earlier around that, that going right along with Jeannie, which is, is the constituents that benefit are, and we think about it as journeys. So the, the customer journey is important from an enterprise perspective, but really from an um, outcome perspective, it's really what does the customer gain uh, from having an intelligent and data-driven enterprise. Uh, better service, you know, uh, uh, better product, uh, a better uh, experience overall. Th those are the things that are important. And, and then it goes into each each component about, of operations. So whether it's the finance function, whether it is the uh, logistics part of an organization, each one of these is uh, benefiting, right? So the people that are part of that. So we talk about these big things around organization and enterprise, but it's really at the end of the day uh, when the analytics and AI capabilities that we're trying to build are really an augmentation for the way we do work. So that so the people that benefit are those that can really use that data analytics and AI better. Okay, great. And and Alex, we just had a, a question come in that I think will be appropriate for you, asking for some advice um, for educating upper management, especially for folks working out of the uh, general U.S. for East Asian companies. Anything to, to add? I, I, I know Wipro has such a wide uh, wide array of, of countries and, and clients, so that might be great for you to kind of add some advice here. Yeah, I'd like to understand the question a little bit more because it, it, I, I interpret it a few different ways. One, one is it that uh, maybe just educating upper management and, and enlightening them in terms of the opportunities. The other one, uh, what we also see oftentimes is are just different issues geography by geography. Uh, and, and it can be things like uh, everybody's talking about GDPR right now in Europe versus the, the way that data is being used in other components, right? So everybody's uh, aware of GDPR today. But there may be some other subtle things where it makes more sense in one geography to emphasize and prioritize versus another geography that could be part of that education, right? Or it, it, the other part that we see uh, it, 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 kind of thinking about that question are the diversity of technology. So when, what we see clients using different technologies in different geographies. Uh, and then being able to leverage processes, leverage best practices, make requires some change in that. And so how do you uh, get to be a more efficient organization to work better across regions? And so that could be part of the education process too, just to help people understand some of the barriers that are happening. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to follow up on that because I think that there's a lot of, a lot of things there. Yeah, I think I, I, I think the additional question around cultural challenges. Why don't why don't we have you kind of address that offline? But that is a very important topic here. I know a lot of people struggle with. Um, so we'll we'll follow up with Prava offline there. But thank you so much. Um, let's see, Jeannie, uh, a, a general sort of cloud question. How is it better to move? Uh, it says on premise. Why is it better to move? Uh, on-premise data warehousing to the cloud. I, I think uh, we we hopefully have a great answer for that. Absolutely, Mel. So I won't get into product tips, although I'm, I'm tempted to. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. For everybody on the line, it's something that we obviously talk about uh, every day with customers, with prospects, because the cloud has given us so many advantages over traditional data warehouses. So I'll break it up into two main pieces. 
The first is your data is growing at an exponential pace. You have volumes of data coming in from social, mobile, and cloud. And it's not just that this workload, it's not just that this volume is here today, it's, it's only increasing. And current on-prem data warehouses are just not designed for that kind of workload and that kind of volume. The second thing I'll talk about is the capabilities that you get with a cloud data warehouse. So there are new analytic paradigms happening in the cloud, like we know, AI, ML. And these cloud-based platforms actually allow you to work with those this types of data. So you have semi-structured data as well as uh, structured data. You have all sorts of JSON data and SQL data, and the cloud is, allows you to work with all your data. It's not so much about the data, it's about the users as well. So the concurrency issues happen. What if you could actually have a data warehouse that allows you to bring in multiple data sets for multiple users. So you have your BI team, you have your IT team, and you may even have your marketing team trying to access that data. A cloud-based data warehouse gives you the concurrency you need to allow multiple users. So summing it up, I would say there's three main factors. I, I broke it up into two initially. Um, one was just the sheer volume of data on-prem data warehouses are unable to handle that. And the second was actually the types of data, but related to that is also the number of users and concurrent users. Okay, thanks, Jeannie. I have another great uh, question that I think will be for both of you and, and would love both of your comments on this. It says, are the most successful data-driven companies today using the BI center of excellence model or more traditional approach falling under the IT department? Um, so that, that's a great question, and, and uh, they're asking for uh, you know both of your opinions here. Um, so where are we with this center of excellence model? And, and let, let's start with Alex here. Uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, we're seeing really uh, maybe a transitioning point in not the center of excellence model, but in what that center of excellence uh, tries to drive in the organization. Um, and this, the rise of the chief data officer, the chief digital officer, uh, other other individuals that are thinking about how to use data, monetizing data, those things are important, and and that that's the underlying change that we're seeing. Uh, some BI competency centers moving to analytics competency centers. We're starting to see uh, the rise of uh, something like an AI type of competency center. I think it just really depends on the organization. Uh, a lot of financial services companies are really moving very fast to AI. You know, I think. Uh, uh, analytics is starting to permeate across all industries, and right now we're hearing, hearing a lot of our manufacturing clients uh, thinking about predictive more and more, you know, going back to that gap question uh, around changes in, 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 in moves to predictive and prescriptive. Uh, I, and so one of the things that we're also seeing is the data science center of excellence because uh, getting that capability and that skill set can be a challenge. So many of our clients can get a handful of data scientists to address a specific issue, but then when you really want to look organizationally a lot of, at a lot of the models you have, how to optimize those models, looking at the interactions between uh, different elements, that's when you really require a lot more scale. So that, that's also what we're seeing is, a, is something like a data science center of excellence. So a lot of things happening. Uh, I wouldn't say that the BI center of excellence is going away, though. Alex, Jeannie, go go right ahead. Alex, I would echo that point, and uh, I know it seems like a sort of this blanket answer to say, well, you need both, but you truly do. And what I mean by that is, in your IT teams or in your uh, database teams, you have your DBA that's uh, whose job it is to really load the data and make it uh, make the query processing faster for the BI folks. So it's it's basically input output. The two teams need to work very well together, and when I look at the most successful teams, it's not so much that it's uh, it's the people working together, but it's the technology that enables the teams to actually work together seamlessly. Everybody in the organization should be interested in getting insights from the data, and so it starts from the, uh, the DBA, getting the right data, the right data files, getting the query to speed to be faster, the BI team getting that data and actually working concurrently with the DBA to make sure that they get the insights that they need and then disseminating throughout the organization. So I wouldn't say it's one or the other. When we, when we look at a perfect enterprise, it's both perfect harmony when, uh, with two teams working together. I think that's a great answer. Um, 
So I, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's presentation and give uh, folks just a couple of minutes back uh, on their busy schedules here. But um, would very much like to thank our uh, special presenters here. Alex, thank you so much. Vijay, thank you. Jeannie, of course, thank you. Um, and if we haven't addressed your questions, we will be following up uh, after this uh, webinar, and you will be getting a copy of the recording. So just want to thank you for your time today, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.